Welcome, everybody, and thanks for hanging out with me. I'm your host, Chuck Federley, and you're listening to Media in the Moment. This is our agency podcast that reviews the most exciting things happening in the world of media. Now, in today's episode, we're talking podcasts, more specifically, advertising in podcasts. So if you're someone who's thought about placing your own ads or perhaps your clients' ads in this medium, this episode is for you. Now, I recently sat down with my guest, Dave Beretti, for a chat about podcast advertising. Now, Dave has worked in and around media his entire career, so I knew it would be a good conversation full of great information. Now, Dave has worked on the agency side for cable television, in radio, podcast networks, and now he works for a company called AdLarge, where he heads up ad sales for podcasts and streaming and AM, FM, and other on-demand audio. So without further delay, let's jump into the episode. Dave, I have to tell you, I've been looking forward to this conversation uh, oh, because thanks. you and I, <laughs> you and I have, have surfed a lot of the same waters in our career. So I think uh, our audience is going to get a lot out of this. But today, our uh, focus is talking about advertising in podcasts. If you've not lived on our planet in the last year or so, <laughs> then you probably don't know what this is. But podcasts are everywhere. How many podcasts are there now, Dave? You know, uh, I think some point in uh, the spring, they surpassed a million on iTunes. Uh, and I, I think you're just stopping to keep track anymore. You know, it, it's just, uh, you know, every day there's probably 30 or 40 more that are launched and uh, growing. For sure. It's a big space. A lot of our clients and advertisers are certainly interested in the space and have done it already. You know, when we ever look at a new medium, you know, one of the things I first always try to do is like, one, how does it fit into the strategy overall? And then two, if that does or if that is a good fit. You know, how is that medium distributed? So I'm looking at podcasts from a 20,000 foot level, and I think it's really just an extension of influencer marketing at the end of the day in, in some regards. Is it not? Absolutely. You know, I think that the essence of the power of this medium is, you know, the, the influence that the hosts enjoy with their communities. You know, in the end, it, it is an on-demand medium that has, as people are discovering it, uh, and the more research we get, the more we're seeing, really turn people onto it, create a, a bigger appetite for more with listeners. Absolutely. Now, I'm a media planner. I'll put my media planner hat on. <laughs> but podcasting is really just another digital audio channel. Right. So if people are looking to find budget for this, I think from our experience, they're taking it from their digital budgets. They might start taking it now from their terrestrial radio budgets. Are you seeing anything different in that regard? That's a, that's a really interesting point. You know, uh, having knocked around here about six years initially, you know, we saw, for instance, network radio buyers, to your point, adding podcasting into their growing audio segment, digital audio, which traditionally have been Pandora and Spotify. And, oh, probably four or five years ago, they started adding growing podcasting into that growing share of the pie because, you know, they just want to be able to go for their advertisers where the listeners are going. Again, this is kind of digital word of mouth, you know, and so the results that they were getting from the podcast, and I'm a huge music fan, but the engagement with podcasts is kind of like radio terms, AM versus FM, um, you know, much higher. And so shares grew quickly there but in the larger scope you know network radio budgets uh, very definitely are including more and more digital and podcasts and have for some time digital budgets from all different sources are being used to play the game and increasingly we're seeing you know dedicated influencer marketing and even experiential and shopper marketing dollars because it is such a versatile medium in terms of delivering different KPIs, you know, from brand awareness, we're seeing more and more brand advertisers come into the game to uh, content for influencer marketing amplification, you know, so it really, it can serve a lot of different masters. You know, what is the industry standard for measurement? You know, how, <laughs> how, right? Because you, you and I both know everybody likes to maybe use a different form of currency when it comes to their media channel but yeah you know how does it how does a show become a number one podcast 
You know, it's there, there's a host of rankers out there. And I think one of the things that uh, as folks first come to the game need to understand it, unlike a pure streaming play, like I say, a Pandora or Spotify, these are RSS feeds. So you're, you're physically, you're, you're actually downloading files as you're listening to a podcast, which is why download numbers in and of themselves are not always the most accurate measurement of this. So you've got probably three different, there's a million different rankers out there, frankly. Um, and, and to get you, the best approach is to kind of get a scope of all of them because they have none of them are apples to apple. So you have you know folks like Apple or uh, Spotify that are more algorithmic. Okay, so they're not measuring size so much as they are acceleration or growth. You've got more based on you know proprietary digital procedures folks who do measure actual uh, size but those are typically volunteers so they don't you know it's only the publishers that participate with them nobody has bottom line a view of the whole podcast atmosphere you know uh, sphere and then there's a third category of rankings that are survey based like media monitors or edison and, and those provide you know more of a reach based perspective you know if people have heard you know a particular podcast in, in essence it, it's it's difficult you know by looking at all three different sources it'll give you a better perspective in terms of size but again that's relative to what your kpis are right you know right in terms of strategies we're seeing evolve using for this space it's really interesting because right a lot of people that are coming into this space who have done some form of advertising want to know how many impressions how many downloads how many streams so are you saying that it's not even getting down to that granular level as uh, a form no, of measurement or it is uh, and one of the things you know that, that is evolving rapidly is the technology you know, in the space the essence uh, or the origins you know 10 years ago of podcasting was all baked in spots you know that were downloaded live read baked in spots and direct to consumer promo codes that you know built brands based again on the influence that our hosts enjoy with their, with their communities. What has evolved now through different serving options is dynamic insertion, where spots now are inserted with various filters that we can, we can put in. And that has allowed for attaching pixels and opened up a whole new world of tracking and measurement capabilities. And so again, depending on the strategies, you know, we've got brand guys that are just looking for awareness. We've got, you know, direct response advertisers that just want, you know, sales. But now, as opposed to just more traditional surveys that have been available by folks like Edison or Nielsen, we have uh, more insightful data from a tracking standpoint in terms of, you know, we can we can attach a pixel to a spot, whether it's a brand read by the host or a pre-produced spot, actually track business to site or even purchase. So these are evolving, you know, as we speak and, and accelerating fast, again, depending on the needs of the brand. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit more about creative. So again, as a planner buyer, we're putting our first podcast plan together here. How should they be thinking? Is this their traditional old 30 second, 60 second live read? Like what, what are the options available to people nowadays? You know, by far the standard still is the live read and whether, you know, there's a lot of flexibility in that. Given there's no program clock in podcasting, you know, I think we've all heard three to five minute reads, you know, as, as the, cause, cause keep in mind, most, <laughs> most hosts compensation is a percentage of sales. So number one, they're hugely grateful to the very few advertisers since there is such a lack of clutter in this space. Sure. Um, they're hugely grateful for those guys who are coming to the table and they know their audience better than anybody. And so that's one of the beauties of the space is that your message is being customized through the filter and perspective and, and the power of the host with, with their people. So we always recommend providing, for instance, copy points versus scripts so they can kind of personalize it because the other kind of built in, you know, positive uh, element of this for, for sponsors is most hosts are going to go out of their way to make sure it works <laughs> for you. Sure, it's sure. Rad, you know? So, you know, these are basically personal endorsements. And so one of the things that also comes into play here for, for most podcast advertisers is the ability to provide the actual product to the host, which we also right. recommend besides giving copy points and, you know, let them filter it down and personalize it is also sending them the product so they can talk about their personal experience with it because they will. From your vantage, and what you do day to day. Let's just put it out there. Is it more expensive for an advertiser to do live reads? Are they priced the same? Does it matter show to show? You know, it, it's more dependent on availability. You know, this is a very volatile market. 
because you do right. only have a couple spots per show, you know, per episode and typically probably 70, 75% of podcasts are weekly that can provide. And by the way, you know, audience growth is changing monthly. So, so, you know, mm-hmm. you've got a really dynamic situation going on here, but in general, you know, there, there are no talent fees, you know, built into, to, you know, that's part of the cost of, of business is, is, you know, it comes with a package. Now that said, there is a growing amount of programmatic. It's still very small right now, under 10%, but growing with pre-produced spots. So you can you can have the host do the read. That can be baked in. So everybody, whoever downloads that forever gets it, or it can be dynamically inserted, which allows for flighting and, and other types of filters. Uh, and again, host read. And those are going to be from, from survey after survey, the most impactful way to use the medium, you know, to take advantage of that influence. But in terms of scale, we're seeing a whole nother strategy develop on the other end of the spectrum where people use pre-produced spots and are buying audience as opposed to particular content or hosts. Sure. And so they're just coming to the table with that, with the understanding that that environment is so valuable, there is efficiencies to be had doing that. Let me interject on that because for those listening, so programmatic is another way of buying media, digital media primarily, whereas a buyer, you can go in and say, this is the type of person or audience I'm trying to reach. And the platform will then bring back to you a myriad of publishers or content, websites, whatever the case may be, right? So you can insert your ads into them. So you're targeting the person more than necessarily a specific form of content or show, right? So this is a really simple way to aggregate all this different type of content, but still hit hit a particular audience. Besides the programmatic, is there any other forms of targeting that are popular these days other than contextual targeting of a particular program? That's been the traditional, you know, I mean, the traditional way now, as the business has been growing up, publishers and networks like ourselves are investing more and more research to better understand our communities. And that can run the range from, you know, individual surveys that are done by either hosts or publishers. Uh, Nielsen and Edison have been very active in that regard. We actually subscribe to a Nielsen podcast buying power survey that gives us a lot of insights besides just demographic, but psychographic information. You know, the platforms themselves, whether it's uh, Megaphone, Art19, they have information on geographic download information or, and device listening, you know, the listen to information that uh, can be available. And then, you know, really social media is the other insight in terms of knowing the core of, of what the host fan base is. And that can you know, provides a lot of insight when we're trying to, you know, whether it's psychographically or demographically match the right message with for, for a sponsor with the right shows. Sounds good. Let, let's do this for fun. You know, again, we're going to planning and buying firm here. So let's pretend we've got this new advertiser and we're trying to reach, let's say, women 18 to 34. The advertiser, the client in mind doesn't necessarily have a particular show they'd like to be on, but they have a demo. They have an audience, they have a profile, they have a lifestyle attached to this demo. If we brought to you a budget, would you put that plan or buy together? What what are some of the things that go into building that for a particular advertiser? One of the keys is the more information we know about the consumer, the more we can you know put together a package, whether it's based on you know budget levels or or other KPIs, but because you run the range of a very esoteric. I mean, there's 20 knitting podcasts out there, right? So, right, <laughs> so you got, right, right. You know, highly targeted to the mass. You know, one of our shows, Crime Junkie, which has been the number one female podcast now for almost two years going on, it's over a million you know, downloads a day, which is just massive. So the more we know about what the KPIs are, if it's brand affinity, if it's, if it's reach, if it's awareness, or if it's driving traffic, you know, that gives us some direction in terms of whether it's a particular content. Because the other thing too, to to remember here is there's a lot of questions when we're going through this process, for instance, content sensitivity, there's no FCC rules here. So, you know, if a package good is concerned about uh, any kind of gratuitous elements that may appear in a podcast where, you know, certain categories like comedy, that could be a huge issue. We'll take all of that into consideration, knowing Again, the knowledge base that we have of our individual hosts and the size of their communities, you know, wh- how we can turn that around to create the most efficient effects or results for the client. It could be 
you know, purchases, it could be raising awareness. You know, we're going to use larger shows to create more reach and awareness, obviously, if that's the event, you know, but there may be some shows, again, depending on the strategic design we would use, it could be much smaller because they're that tight in terms of producing just, you know, if I'm knitting, <laughs> right. I want to do an knitting podcast. Yeah. Right, right, right. Well, I guess, you know, it's no surprise that direct response advertisers have loved this space, maybe for specifically that reason or the fact that the audiences tend to be more engaged uh, when they're listening to that host or they're more into the content than, let's say, a traditional broadcast medium. But yeah, you always need to keep the end result in mind of why you're advertising, right? So if it is awareness, if it is a lead generation, a sale, what have you, that will certainly dictate what types maybe of programs we want to be on in the podcast arena. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And I what think, you know, they're, they're so sensitive to conversion rates, you know, the direct to consumer, direct response element where brand advertisers, which is growing fast, you know, it's, it's again, creating more demand and stress on everybody's inventory, but they have entirely different metrics. It's interesting that, you know, there's a number of different categories, for instance, that don't typically do audio advertising, you know, uh, food right. products apparel, you know, typically categories that are very video and visual centric in their, as their research is getting more granular at P&G and S.C. Johnson and Kraft, they're seeing podcasting popping up left and right on the path to purchase. So this has been hugely influential and recognized as determining brand preference early in the game. And so that creates a whole nother set of objectives to reach depending on, you know, uh, their goals as they come to the market. So sure. I, about half, it's not quite 50-50, Brand to, um, uh, I think the last I saw in April, IAB was estimated about 42% of all podcasting was brand, but it will be soon if it's not already. Right. One of the big differences is when you're out buying podcasts, we get this question all the time is, how are my, uh, I hate to use the word spots, but how, are, how yeah. is my announcement message inserted into the show? And, you know, there's two kind of main ways, right? It's either dynamic or embedded. Is that correct? Right. And could you explain what that means? So uh, traditionally, you know, embedded or the podcast guys will say baked in spots are read by the host at the time the episode is put together. It's posted and it lives there forever. Uh, so anybody, which is a real, you know, for, for a lot of it's why stamps.com or some of these people, <laughs> you know, right. some of these shows forever, they're just growing their base of, of where, where baked in spots are, are the exclusive distribution method. But it also prohibits any type of flighting or retail, for instance, or, or other categories from, from touching it because the sale could be over by the time this person listens to it. So there One needs to be zero time sensitivity. For a big spot, yeah. Method. Because the other element that we saw is as people discover new podcasts, they'll go back and listen. They'll binge listen just like people will binge view Netflix or, or Hulu. That is a big portion of our listenership. You know, for some for some shows, up to 60 or 70 percent of their impressions in a given week are from, you know, catalog or, or live, you know, backlog uh, episodes. Right. So, which, you know, is great if you're, you know, baked in and you're still, you know, offers still exist, but, you know, for, for a movie premiere or a, a weekend mattress sale, you know, that's, that's not going to fly. Right. And that has been addressed with dynamic insertion, where now we have the capabilities to, you know, guarantee a retailer a 5 p.m. start on Wednesday with a noon cutoff on Sunday. And, and the level of filtration is advancing as we go, you know, so there's more geotargeting available. So let me ask you this again, back to pricing. Is mm -hmm. there a is there a big price disparity, if at all, between dynamic or embedded? You know, I, the more filters you put on, and not surprisingly, you know, the more expensive dynamic insertion, where one of those capabilities exist, the more expensive that's going to be. It varies hugely, you know, too, in terms of CPMs or if it's a baked in spot, you know, host read fees or costs from host to host from show to right. show so in general you know you probably go in if it's just a very simple filtered you know dynamic insertion spot and again the other leverage here is the size of the budget frankly you know so if you, if you come to the table there, there's certain hosts and, and uh shows that are more negotiable than others based on demand and everything else 
um, you know, I think that's the appeal of uh, where we're buying audiences more than specific hosts with, with reads uh, is that that does provide for a lower CPM access to this environment. Sure, sure. Do you think right now, I mean, again, from your vantage point, are people buying single podcasts really, or is it really this more of a sort of a network feel where they're going after just so many shows because they want the reach? Right. No, I got to say the vast majority of sales are still program specific. Okay. Because they do want that, you know, again, the power of, of this medium is that influence and the host read that endorsement, you know, that word of mouth, which is only available in, in this space. This is one of the things that really sets podcasting off is the ultimate way to use this medium. Correct. It's a great thing to remember everybody as far as your strategy when doing this. If you could look back, you know, over maybe the last year or two of some people that you've worked with, are there any great success stories or maybe just categories of clients that do really well? You know, it, the, the financial category and packaged goods um, mm -hmm. have been probably the biggest areas of growth. But, you know, I, I think there's been some interesting insights on, again, alternative uses or as, as we're extending, learning to extend this influence across other platforms where, you know, we're seeing more and more, for instance, uh, host to, you know, live tours. So, you know, we can offer on-site activation or retail activation. I think one of the more interesting success stories uh, here in here in Chicago, Turtle Wax was just looking basically for content to be able to amplify out of their social influencer sources. And so to provide a monthly interview show that then they could run with uh, was a very different use, but created a lot of awareness and generation for them. On the other hand, you know, we've got some some major brands at P&G who, you know, we've been doing uh, brand lift studies with Edison who say they've never seen this kind of increase in brand affinity or intention to buy. Um, and they're overwhelmed by, you know, so again, based on, you know, what people are coming to the game here, trying to achieve. And then they continued, you know, obviously with a lot of the direct response advertisers, they don't share their conversion rates, but when we see, you know, a doubling or tripling of investment, we figure it's probably working for them. You know? It probably <laughs> is. Yes, um, it probably is. A lot of that going on too. So back again to real quick on the media planning side. So what, what, what is a person, what does an advertiser see when you guys, you know, deliver a plan to them? I mean, are you showing them obviously here that maybe they're buying a handful of different programs? Mm -hmm. Are you showing them sort of an estimated delivery? You know, they're not yeah. buying spots. Let's be clear, everybody. You're not buying spots. This is a traditional radio. You're, you're embedding a spot or maybe you're dynamically inserting a, a message. But how is that shown or how is that, how do you show delivery? Sure. No, it's a good, good question. So typically a plan will, will look like an Excel sheet that shows the show and the, the type of messaging that it is, whether it's, you know, pre-produced or uh, host read with uh, guaranteed deliveries by week uh, and, and a result of CPM that will vary from show to show. And they're typically bought, um, well, again, more for the branding purposes with direct to consumer, direct response. It's They're more in a testing phase where they'll do, you know, two or three week tests. Uh, we actually, we, we typically will recommend a four to six week test mm -hmm. because for whether it's branding or, or direct to consumer, because remember a lot of, you know, as these podcasts are downloaded, number one, they're not always listened to immediately. You know, from Edison research, we know that uh, something like 85% of the people listen to the to the podcast from the, the launch day that's released or posted within the first six or seven days, you know, but there's a, there's a tail on these. So, and the other point is that, you know, most of them are weekly. So to build any kind of frequency, depending on, again, uh, what we're trying to achieve, you will get a much better read over the course of a five to seven week participation with once a week read than you will just trying to do one read and, and gauge the results of that. You know. that's, that's an excellent thing to remember. And we, we talked to many clients about that. Again, juxtaposed to how they're traditionally buying an audio solution. This is different. You know, you have to look at it differently and you have to allow for that time for the audience to not only download, but listen to the episode. How many of us right, have gone back and I know I do it and listen to three or four episodes of maybe a show that I found that, oh, let me go back and listen to some of the stuff from the beginning. Uh, those are all added impressions, obviously, that advertiser is getting. Great information to remember. And then wrapping up a uh, whole buy scenario for us, is there any sort of post-reporting that an advertiser in podcasting can expect? Yeah, no, depending on, you know, as different elements of the negotiation for brand advertisers, typically, you know, we will provide a guarantee, for instance, a, a weekly delivery. 
and can provide if it's an upfront buy we're seeing more and more upfront buys coming down now because the other element to remember here is that uh, many podcast buys where host reads are involved it doesn't apply to pre-produced spots but for host reads very often category exclusivity is part of the deal sure so, you know, going back three or four years, it was hard to find a podcast that didn't have a mattress in it. You know, people were just buying out of their <laughs> vision. Uh, right. And we've seen different categories come into the game right now. Like I said, financial insurance in particular is, is better understanding the power of this medium and, and trying to grab folks off. You know, but, but all that said, that could be definitely structured, whether it's, you know, on a quarterly basis or for the whole buy where there's a post report done that can show you, you know, down to the episode level, the number of deliveries based on the negotiation and whether how it's performed because especially where dynamic insertion is involved where we have more flexibility in delivery we can keep much bigger tabs on that you know, with sure. fake spots you don't quite have the the control that you have from a serving standpoint that you do with dynamically inserted buys sure sure well listen wrapping things up podcasting is certainly not going anywhere advertising in podcasts is growing what do you think the future is overall within the space you know, both from an advertising perspective, maybe as well as a content perspective. Yeah, I think, you know, we've seen a lot of growth really in the last year or two with certain categories, like everything from just straight women, because, you know, four or five years ago, so many of the podcasts were comedy, sports. Uh, it was a very male centric uh, world uh, five or six years ago. Sure. Um, but there's also, if you build it, they'll come kind of mentality. I think a lot of folks. Sure, right? sure. We've seen big growth in Hispanic and African American and women uh, as, as the content has been there. And that's just going to continue. I believe both the, the quantity and the quality podcasts are going to continue to, to grow. Um, as well as uh, our technological capabilities, you know, in, in that digital word of mouth, you know, we're, we're you know, it's going to be more focused on the digital part because the word of mouth is going to be there, you know, forever. Sure. And I think from a, from a business standpoint, you're going to see a lot more consolidation going on from this side of the desk as right. people are, you know, it, it's not a, for investors, a new, you know, business anymore. And it's providing a lot of interest uh, from the terms of scale in the business community. The ultimate bottom line on this, you know, is that influence that these guys enjoy with their and gals, with their communities, and how you know we grow that, how we look at you know extending that to, to anything from other platforms to uh, you, you saw a couple of years back a lot of TV shows being spun off of podcasts. You know, there, so it's a source of uh, constant creative stimulation, I think, and one that, uh, as I said earlier, you know, as as our listeners get into it they really get into it. it enables a lot of natural curiosity and uh, we're seeing habits change just during covid you know has, has been interesting i think the average podcast listener during covid has increased their listening to half an hour to about i think over six and a half hours a week the average podcast listener listens to podcasts so the longer they're into it the more people listen to podcasts so it's a, a sunny future as we learn and in, in this space evolves for sure it's not going anywhere hey let's wrap this up with our personal favorite podcast that we're listening to. I'll let you go first. <laughs> well, you know, I for for me coming to here, true crime has been kind of a new uh, it's a great show for me, and so I'm just blown away by <laughs> right. And it's kind of addictive. I gotta admit, it's <laughs> yeah, that's a great one. That's a great one. I found this just a few weeks ago from doing uh, watching one of the podcast upfront events that was online. Mine's called the Newsworthy. I've been a news junkie lately, and ah. I'm I'm tired of all the slanted news out there. So this is a great one. Uh, great host, and she does a really good job. It's called the Newsworthy for for our listeners. Dave and I could have gone on for another hour, but for your sake, we'll stop it here. If you'd like to learn more, you can request a copy of the podcast planning guide. Click the link below or email us at info at tec-direct.com. I want to send out a big thanks to my guest, Dave Beretti. Thanks to my super producer, Heidi Mater. And thank you for listening. I hope you come back and join me again real soon for another episode of Media in the Moment. Take care. <laughs>